This episode of Beyond the Uniform is sponsored by Storybox. People trust each other more than they trust advertising. Storybox provides companies with the tools they need to take the best things their customers are saying and use these testimonials to drive more sales and referrals. You can find out if Storybox is right for you at storyboxlight.com. If you employ a veteran, we'll also give you a 10% discount. That's storyboxlight.com. Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and each week I interview military veterans about their civilian career. Today is episode number 114 with Justin Cook. So working for this company, we started outsourcing to the Philippines, and we started doing more and more work with the Philippines. And eventually, you know, my buddy and I said, look, you know, why don't we set up a company in the Philippines to do the outsourcing for our employer? So we pitched our bosses, our CEO and CFO, and the idea, and they loved it. They said, sure, you know, we don't want to own furniture and hire staff in the Philippines. But you guys, we trust, are willing to go over there and do that. That sounds amazing. So that kind of like got our, our foot in the door. My guest today, Justin Cook, is the founder of Empire Flippers, which is an Inc. 500 company. A couple of reasons why I think this will be interesting to Beyond the Uniform listeners. The first is he talks about non-sexy businesses, companies that you might not uh, hear about, you might not know about, but are profitable companies. His company, Empire Flippers, helps business owners sell these sorts of companies, but he also helps people buy, sell, and invest in profitable websites and online businesses. Um, Second, he talks about mastermind groups, finding experts in different fields, assembling a group around you where you can vet different ideas, you can run ideas by each other. This is good for anyone, regardless of what business you're in. Third, he talks about the skills necessary for running an online business. He has sold so many different companies, over $27 million in online businesses. He's got a uh, a lot of great advice for veterans who are thinking of running an online business. Fourth, he talks about how to evaluate buying a business. This could be a great path to entrepreneurship for many veterans. If you don't have a great idea, you don't know what to do, you can always purchase an existing business, optimize it, and sell it, or just grow it. And last of all, he talks about creating the company um, that he wants. He's built an organization that's a company you'd want to work in for the rest of his life. And I think that's a really inspiring message. As always, at beyondtheuniform.io, you can sign up for our newsletter. You can find show notes about everything we discuss in this interview. And you can also check out our free offer from audible.com at beyondtheuniform.io slash books. You can get a free ebook of your choice uh, for listening, and Beyond the Uniform gets a little bit of money to help offset the cost of the show. So with that, let's dive in to my interview with Empire Flippers founder, Justin Cook. Well, joining me today in uh, Saigon, Vietnam, of all places, is Justin Cook. Justin, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Thanks for having me on, Justin. Appreciate it. So first, I want to just give a special thanks to one of our listeners, Aaron Birch. Uh, He had emailed me and suggested Justin for the show. And uh, Justin's got a very unique story. I'm, I'm very excited to dive in. He's the founder at Empire Flippers, which is a company that helps others buy, sell, and invest in profitable websites and online businesses. Uh, he started out in the Navy, where he spent six years as a sonar technician second class. And Empire Flippers is an Inc. 500 company. Uh, Justin runs a 22-person team, and we'll talk about it's actually a remote, it's a distributed team, and they have over $27 million in online businesses sold. Um, and so, actually, maybe, Justin, just to start off, you're, uh, you're, you're in Vietnam right now. You might not be in Vietnam tomorrow. Could you just share a little bit more about your wife and yours life right now with this distributed team? Yeah, so I have a business partner. He kind of home bases in Manila, Philippines, uh, where we have a, quite a history. We you know, ran a company in the Philippines for a while, set up a corporation there. It's kind of how we got out of the U.S. But, you know, I'm kind of the roamer of the group. So, you know, I will spend, you know, a month and a half in Saigon and then, you know, six weeks in Bangkok and visit some people up in Chiang Mai and then two weeks in Bali, two weeks in Hong Kong. So I generally travel around. I, I live out of Airbnbs a lot. Um, and they have uh, a service departments over here in Southeast Asia, which are basically just moving into a fully furnished, fully prepared, staffed, maid service kind of home. 
And so it makes it really easy to travel around um, and have kind of your home away from home and always be on the road. Um, it can get stressful, especially when we're doing like, you know, one week here, one week there. But if we're doing six weeks at a time, it's relatively easy to land and kind of like get back into a groove just because I'm typically going to places that, you know, I go to pretty regularly. So we, we take some trips like last uh, last summer we went to Europe and then this November we're heading to South America for a few months. But I basically built a life of travel kind of into the business and, and our team does that as well. So our employees, and our staff regularly travel around. We we get everyone together every every four months or so and we get together for a month and we call it our kind of managers meeting or managers retreat where we get our staff together. We all work from villas or we you know rent some like penthouse apartments. We all kind of work and live together for three to four weeks and then kind of like go our separate ways. So we get the the benefits of working together, um, but then we get kind of the separation that lets us travel and explore and do that kind of thing. That's so cool. It's just uh it makes me think of that George Clooney movie up in the air, just this, this thought of how lightweight it is for your life where you, you can live and work anywhere and how cool it would be to be able to pick up and move and see the world as rather than a cubicle, you're seeing the world on a day to day basis. And I think it's just a cool example of uh, the way that the job market is changing now where your team is all remote and you guys still get stuff done. So I think that's just really cool. Yeah, between Airbnb and Uber, I mean, in any major city, you know, you're going to be able to get around without necessarily having a home. Now, I've been semi home based in Saigon for the last nine months. I mean, I'm here maybe half the time. And I got married uh, in Vietnam this last March. So I've got stuff. I, we started accumulating stuff. <laughs> and we're getting ready to hit the road October 9th. We're out of here again, uh, long term. So. You know, I'm uh, we're you know, packing stuff up, sending it to you know my wife's family's house, and we have to fit back into a couple of suitcases. So that'll be exciting. And, and I'm assuming, you know, I'm assuming one of the contributing reasons for the the location choice is just lower in your operating costs. Is that right? Yeah. So I mean, in general, well, when we started off, you know, we we worked for like a mid-sized company in the U.S. It was an SEO company, and you know, I traveled. I was in the Navy before, and I'd done two Westpac deployments. So I'd been to through Southeast Asia, you know, from coming from California and knew that the cost of living was cheap. And I, it was always a thought like, wow, if I could make dollars and spin pesos or bot or dong, right? Like that'd be, that'd be fantastic. Mm. Um, but I never really had the opportunity to. So working for this company, we started outsourcing to the Philippines and we'd had a previous connection there that was a virtual assistant. And we started doing more and more work with the Philippines. And eventually, you know, my buddy and I said, look, you know, why don't we set up a company in the Philippines to do the outsourcing for our employer? So we pitched our bosses, our CEO and CFO on the idea, and they loved it. They said, sure, you know, we don't want to own furniture and hire staff in the Philippines. If you guys we trust are willing to go over there and do that, that sounds amazing. So that kind of like got our, our foot in the door. It's still, though, you know, we went to set up the corporation in the Philippines and we were working basically contracting for our previous employer with an outsourcing company. But we were doing it kind of like from one home base, which is in California, to a new home base, which is in Davao City, Philippines, in the south of the Philippines on the southern island. And, you know, we were still like a, you know, we were moving to Davao. We weren't like location independent. We weren't doing the full on travel thing. And over a few years, I talked to some friends, particularly friends from the run a podcast called Tropical NBA. Um, and they run a community called the Dynamite Circle, which was just starting off then. And they were trying to build like this community for like location independent entrepreneurs. And we didn't, we knew nothing about this. We were kind of running our business on an island, so to speak, like actually, and, and, you know, uh, um, practically, uh, and, and we met and talked to these other people that were building online businesses that were remote and they did this travel thing. And we were like, wow, I, I never Yes, we're in the Philippines. Yes, we take cool little vacations and trips, little mini, vac mini, you know, retirements and vacations. But I never thought that we could just pack up and like travel around. So, you know, my girlfriend and I, my girlfriend at the time and I said, "Look, I think I think we'd like to do that." So we sold off all our stuff in the Philippines. You know, packed a couple of large suitcases and just started traveling around. And there's there's Wi-Fi everywhere now. I mean, you pop into a new country, you know, you grab a SIM card buy a quick like a cheap data plan and you're good to go so basically when you're when you're when you're bootstrapping um you i even know people that are making 2500 bucks a month three grand a month and living pretty well i mean they can't 
you know, like do premium travel or anything. But, you know, flights are relatively cheap. Places like Chiang Mai and Bali, Saigon, definitely Davao are relatively inexpensive. You can live there reasonably well for 2500 bucks a month. So as you start making more money, you're, start, you're able to have these like really premium experiences, things that you wouldn't be able to do in the U.S. I mean, if you're making $8,000 a month and traveling around Southeast Asia, you can live really well. This is incredible. Well, I, I want to spend the bulk of our time on Empire Flippers because I think that um, I imagine a lot of veterans will find this sort of approach to entrepreneurship appealing, especially I hear a lot where people say, I want to do something entrepreneurial and I don't know what that is. And so I think that what you've built could be a really cool venue for them. But I, I always like to back up and, um, you know, you've done quite a bit between the Navy and Empire Flippers. So what would you want listeners to know about your path from the Navy to um, up until starting Empire Flippers? Uh, it was, it's weird. It wasn't terribly connected. You, you talk, you and I talked a little bit before the show. We talked about, you know, um, getting out of the military and not at all having any clear idea of what to do. And I know that, you know, this podcast serves as a resource for them. I wasn't around when I got out in 2002 and it was super unclear in terms of what you could do and the, the resources provided weren't great. So I knew that I was going to go to school. I said, well, you know, uh, and, and this is my thought process at the time that, you have to go to school to get a good job, to live a good life and get your picket fence and your two and a half kids. And that's kind of the path, you know, everyone's supposed to take. And so, you know, I, I got out and said, look, I'll use my GI Bill and college fund. I was you know, enlisted in the Navy and and said, um, you know, I'll, I'll use that and I'll build my life that way. And and I kind of, you know, I fumbled into entrepreneurship. My my business partner now, um, but buddy at the time was like, look, you know, this mortgage thing is going really well for me. I'm making a lot of money. So I ended up kind of like getting into that. And, and as we made good money in the mortgage industry, we realized there was an opportunity for us to go off on our own and actually create a mortgage brokerage. Now we did that um, and ended up failing miserably, um, both due to our <laughs> mistakes we made and also the, you know, the industry in 2007, 2008 was drying up pretty heavily, but you know, it kind of like got our feet wet in terms of entrepreneurship. So, I mean, for anyone listening, I, you know, I, I think, I think there are resources out there, and I'm going to you know, share some throughout the course of this podcast that I hope will help you that would have helped me if they were around at the time. That's great. Um, you know, uh, you had mentioned your co-founder. I'm just curious, do you have any advice for any veterans listening who are thinking of, of trying to vet and find that co-founder? It sounds like it was someone who was a friend, but any any advice on how to figure out if you might work well together with someone or if they're, they're going to be a good partner? Yeah, I think uh, with our business partnership, I got really lucky. And I tell people the kind of the way we partner generally I've seen doesn't work out terribly well. So we were, you know, buddies for a long time, um, ended up getting into business together probably because we just wanted to do it with someone else. Like it was too scary to do it on our own. And we figured, you know, I know this guy, you know, we've known each other a long time. Let's go into business with a buddy. And that's just, that's just like, it's just bad. Like that's probably not the best approach. Um, looking back, I could have done some of the things I was doing without that it, it, through the use of like mastermind. So I guess the first thing would be, don't be scared to go it alone. Um, it's a lot easier. The second thing is it's a lot easier to uh, bring on a co-founder, uh, a business partner, um, and they can get a minimal equity split once you have a business that's up, running, and profitable. So I have a friend, a good example of this, is a buddy over at, he ran a company called WP Curve. His name's Dan Norris. And he built the business up to profitability, had a small team, and then started looking for and receiving offers to partner, was able to bring on and like really vet partners that had real business chops. So a lot of times if you're starting out, you know, you're kind of stuck with who you know. But if you build a profitable business and get it running, you're going to run into a lot more opportunities and probably better fits for your partnership. That's great. I'd never actually heard of that before, but that makes a ton of sense. If, if, you're, if you're unproven and the business is fledgling and unproven, you, you might not be able to attract as much as, as good of a talent. It's certainly for employees, but I never thought about that from the perspective of a co-founder. Of Then once you get some traction, it's a lot easier to, to say, hey, I've got something great that's big, that's growing, and, and you can probably get a little bit uh, better quality person that way. I just, I just had a girl email me um, yesterday, actually, and she was talking about partnering with someone. It was a cousin of hers, which is another bad, bad idea. Family can really 
throw wrenches in, in business relationships. I, I know this personally. Um, uh, so she was looking at partnering with her cousin. And her cousin had experience running. It was, she was trying to open up like a spa and salon. And her co- cousin had experience running like as a supervisor and working in spa and salon. I was telling her, I said, look, you know, that may be a good partner for you. But here's the thing. Like it'll help initially. So you kind of do this partnership with her and she knows how to initially get everything set up and kind of running. But that's eventually a position you can just hire for. Yeah. I mean, you don't need to give up any equity. Um, so in fact, I don't think you need to do a full on 50 50 partnership, which is what she was thinking about. It's like, look, you, you could bring her on and, and potentially offer a profit share or let her earn into an equity position as you're the one kind of setting everything up and putting everything together. So. You know, and because eventually, like, like in the short term, it's gonna be really helpful for, for you. But long term, you know, I don't unless unless she changes and really starts uh, to add a lot more value to the business, I don't see how that's gonna be um, an equitable split. Mm. And what was the genesis of Empire Flippers? Do you remember like a, a certain moment where the idea came about? Yeah, so we we pivoted. Um, I mentioned that you know we worked for a mid-sized SEO company in the U.S., set up the outsourcing company, and moved to the Philippines. So my business partner and I moved to the Philippines, and shortly after that, within a year, our previous employer started to cut back on a we had a no-cut contract, an agreement that they wouldn't cut for three years, and of course, you know they were in the financial difficulties and start cutting back on us. Uh, we're expendable, so they start you know cutting back on on our business. And that was scary. So we had to lay some people off and got to kind of like core employees and said, look, these people are skilled. We don't want to have to let them go. So what else can we do? So we tried out a few things. And one of the things we tried was, you know, building kind of profitable websites. We would build advertising based sites uh, that we'd, we'd slap AdSense on the site's ads and write content that was interesting and, uh, you know, easily um, rankable on Google right, in terms of SEO. So we we built these sites and they were making some money and and they you know they make hundred bucks two hundred bucks three hundred bucks a month and we realized we had these little small cash flowing assets and we realized that over time that you know people were really interested in this process we were talking about it publicly on a blog called AdSense Flippers at the time and we were talking about our process and people really loved it eventually you know we said look we we need to find we want to scale this up but we're already maybe like ten thousand dollars in the hole and it wasn't making us much money. So what do we do? And so my business partner and I thought about it. And we eventually said, look, let's see if we can sell some of these off. So to give you an example, if I have a 500 like a website that's earning 500 bucks a month, right? If I can sell that today for, let's say, $10,000, $12,000, right? Someone to give that money to me. I can reinvest that money into building out, let's say, 20, 25 new sites, right? So I'm able to realize future cash flow today and reinvest that into the business. So it kept us from going out of pocket and it allowed us to kind of like scale up the process. So we were building these sites, selling them off, building these sites, selling them off. We had a factory, a machine that was doing this. And eventually our process for building those became less and less successful. Our sites weren't ranking as well. They weren't earning as much money. But we had this, we built up this audience of people that were looking to buy websites and looking to buy online businesses. And they were hungry and we didn't have the supply. So we said, you know, there's an opportunity here. We still have all these people that want to buy businesses. We're not producing enough and it's not as profitable for us. What if we let other people sell their websites and businesses with us? And so we tried that. It went really well. And we ended up stopping everything else, every other business interest we had. We sold our outsourcing company. We gave away everything else. We dropped every other project and decided to double down on this brokerage. And we called it Empire Flippers. And, you know, that's kind of how we got started. I think we did, you know, we were doing maybe low five figures in sales um, and even less in in profit and we get 15% on the deal. So if we do $100,000 in deals, we make $15,000 off that. So, you know, we start off in the five figures, then went up to six figures, then eventually got to seven figures a month. I mean, there's a couple things I just want to pause for listeners. I mean, first of all, seven figures a month is unreal. That's a tremendous amount of money to, to to be doing. But I also just want to point out the courage that it took to 
have a business that was making money, which in and of itself is a miracle to pull off. That's very, very difficult to do. And then to be open to seeing that your existing business that had gotten you there wasn't the business that you wanted to be a part of going forward, to recognize a bigger opportunity and to take that bet, to double down. I can imagine there was a lot of uncertainty and I can imagine there's a lot of risk in that decision. But I, I just really want to point out the, the courage it must have taken to not only have the ingenuity to see that opportunity, but then to seize it rather than just kind of sticking with what was working, which I think a lot of people would do in that situation. Well, not to, not to crack on my courage here, but I'll tell you <laughs> a, a bit. There's, there's uh, you know, we, when our, with the sites we were building were hugely profitable, right? If we, you know, let's say invest, you know, 500 bucks and get 5,000 out inside of 12 months, like, you know, we were crushing it. Like our, our return on these investments were just amazing. And so at that time, we had, we actually had people asking to sell their sites with us, their businesses with us. We told them no, and it was fear-based, right? Because we were worried if we started listing other people's sites or businesses that we're getting 100% on, um, and people start buying someone, you know, these other sellers' businesses, and we're only getting 15%. Like, what if that killed our cash cow, mm. right? So it wasn't until that became, you know, like we had problems or we realized that wasn't quite as effective that we were open to the idea, but. You're right, once we were open to the idea, we dumped everything else. And this included um, a profit stream that was make, making us about ten, eight to $10,000 a month, I think. Um, and we gave that up. We just completely dropped it because we were devoting man hours and resources and energy into that. And it was like products and services effectively. And we dropped that completely to, to double down on the brokerage because we saw that's where the future was. Mm. And we, we did a talk on this right around that time. and. We said, we don't know how that's, this is gonna turn out, but this is our kind of gamble, this is our bet. And we see the industry, we see the market and where it's going, and we think it's a good opportunity. And it's, it's really paid off, it, 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 it ultimately did. But at the time, you're right, it was, it was frightening to go through that. And, and you kind of already described a little bit, but just if someone's on active duty right now listening, how would you describe to them Empire Flippers, like what you do and where you are today? So, well, I'll get to that. First, I want to say that kind of the websites and the businesses we're, I'm talking about here, this is not Shark Tank. This is not the profit. You know, we're, we're not talking VC-backed companies that are going to be the next Twitter or the next, next Facebook. These are kind of businesses for the rest of us. Some of them are making, you know, $1,200 a month, right? Some of them are making, you know, eighteen thousand dollars a month but usually you know it's one or two people maybe they got a couple of people on their team these are kind of like you know not like the online version of a you know a grocery store or you know they're, they're selling for our minimum is like twenty thousand and we sell up to our largest sale so far it's been 1.7 million so we're not talking you know 50 billion dollar deals here they're much smaller but they're real businesses i mean these are real entrepreneurs really making money that have built real solid businesses. And that's, I think, what's kind of fun about it. And, um, and, and one thing I just want to chime in here is that, um, you know, because I, I, I run like a venture-backed startup that's technology. And so I'm, I'm uh, you can bear this with a grain of salt because I come from like a, a, a little bit of a jaded Silicon Valley approach, which is, yeah. um, you know, when you start those companies, Twitter and Uber, they do have the potential to be billion-dollar companies. Like they do have the potential to change the world. And there's a lot of um, volatility in that. There's a lot of betting, like venture capitalists are placing educated bets uh, in hopes that out of 20 companies, one becomes a billion dollar company and then the other 19 will most likely fail. Um, what I love yeah. about what you're describing, Justin, is while these companies are not maybe the next technology breakthrough, they are businesses. They are solid businesses that are generating cash. And for me, when I think of most veterans, I, I think that most veterans that have an entrepreneurial itch, they can learn the skills they need to, to systematically grow a company, to build a process, to grow revenue and to shrink costs and to like block and tackle. I think that most veterans are really good at that. And it doesn't rely on finding the next killer idea, which is hard for anyone, let alone for a veteran who may be new to business. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring up my buddy's example because we have a, a lot of businesses we've you know, sold 
uh, we have you know, NDAs or non-disclosure agreements with that, and I can't share the niche after the fact, but I'll mention my buddy's company again, uh, Dan Norris, WP Curve, right? This is a business where you know, he started off asking friends and other entrepreneurs and peers that he knows, hey, would you pay a monthly fee for like small kind of WordPress fix from a developer or like a, um, a designer? You know, pay me less than 100 bucks a month just to kind of have that peace of mind if someone can help you with WordPress. We're like, yeah, that seems like a cool idea. That works. I actually told him I'm not sure how well that'll work. Um, but uh, <laughs> he ended up doing it and, and got a bunch of us to sign up and start off small. He hired some virtual assistants. And it wasn't this crazy tech company. It wasn't, you know, he didn't have to raise a ton of funds to do it. Um, and he just started kind of like, you know, building the kind of behind the scenes team of virtual assistants that were able to deliver the goods and then charging people a monthly service fee to do it. And they start off relatively small, but were profitable all the way along. Um, in most of the businesses, the huge majority of the businesses we're dealing with haven't raised any money. Uh, they have no investments other than the entrepreneur or entrepreneurs that are involved in it. So it's completely profitable and completely owned by them. And I think we need the people taking stabs at Twitter. I think we need the people taking stabs at Facebook. But those people aren't going to heed my discouragement from that anyway. Right, so they're going to keep they're they're going to they're going to do it anyway. For the rest of us, and for the entrepreneurs or you know budding entrepreneurs um, that are and veterans that are listening to this podcast, there are ways to do it without raising crazy rounds and and having the kind of pressure of VC money. I mean, when you when you take on funds, you're promising promising might be a strong word, but you're telling them, look, I'm going to grow 10x, 20x, 50x, and you have like targets you need to hit, which means you're hiring like crazy. You're, I mean, it's it's a really intensive process. Whereas if it's your company and your money, you're the one making the decision and you may be limited by finances, but it also, I think, gives you an opportunity to correct that a lot of the like really fast moving startups in the tech world don't have. And, you know, you've, you've seen so many different people grow companies and you've, you've grown your own company as well. I, I'm curious what advice you have, you know, in addition to this fundraising piece, what advice do you have for someone who might be on active duty right now who's thinking of starting their own company or maybe purchasing their, their, their own company when they get out of the military? Uh, well, one of the, there's some relatively, there's a whole bunch of online business models uh, that I can share. I'll share a link with you. It's the Talk about the 11 popular online business models. And it kind of goes into some depth in terms of the different monetization strategies and how those businesses work, and then how you can view them from like, through like a buyer or a seller lens. Um, so what I would suggest for you know uh, veterans getting out and looking for their career path is to find a, one of those models that kind of works for you. Maybe it's drop shipping, which basically means you know you're um, having the manufacturer ship under your life, slapping your label on the product and shipping it directly to the customer. Maybe it's Amazon FBA, where you're sourcing uh, the products from China or the US, shipping it to Amazon and then selling through Amazon, having Amazon ship it out to the customer. Uh, maybe it's an Amazon associate site where all you're doing is creating content sites, putting Amazon links up, and when people click through those links and they buy from Amazon, you get a percentage of the sales. So there's all these different business models the best thing to do is to find one that works or that you want to make work and stick with it. What happens to a lot of people kind of new and starting off is they chase after the latest shiny new object, right? So, you know, a couple of years ago, it was three, four years ago, it was drop shipping. Then a lot of people move from drop shipping to Amazon FBA. I don't know what the next thing would be. I know some people are moving on to Amazon Merch. So there are all these like different types of businesses you can chase after. But the problem there is you get kind of good at one and never really nail it home, never really get good at that. Um, so I think picking a, a business model that, that makes sense to you and sticking with it has a ton of value. Um, just doing something for years and years on end gets you particularly good at it. Putting in the, uh, the hours to become an expert um, is really helpful. And, and aside from that, I'd also suggest, especially if it's just you and you don't have a co-founder, you don't have a partner, is joining masterminds. Um, there are a lot of masterminds out there. Some of them are like through paid communities. Some of them are Facebook communities. But find one that you gel with um, that can kind of like, you know, kind of cure the entrepreneurial loneliness. Um, it sucks when you're starting off a lot of this. I didn't have this problem, but a lot of people do. So I'll mention it. They, they struggle because they don't have anyone they can talk to about what they're doing. 
their friends from the Navy are not doing that. Um, they're kind of, they feel like they're on their own, right? And so having peers you can at least talk with and kind of like share stories and you know, help each other um, is really, really helpful. And, um, you know, for those not familiar with this mastermind concept, um, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Justin, but it's basically you have a group of people that you meet with regularly and people have different expertise, but you're helping each other. So when you have a business decision, you can bring it before the group and get a lot of different feedback and have kind of like a vetting process, especially if you're working on your own. Is, is that is that accurate, Justin? Yeah, so the earlier you are, probably the more often you meet. So if you're really kind of like idea phase, maybe once a week or even uh, twice a month might be a good fit. If you kind of already, if you're already established, you've got customers, you're kind of growing, maybe once a month. Um, if you're larger, you have a team, and you have like you takes more time to kind of like you know get initiatives out, maybe once a quarter. Um, so it'll depend kind of on on where you're at in your business stage. But yes, that's the general idea. We would do. Um, like right now, right, we do a quarterly masterminds and we do it hot seat style. So some between five and seven of us, when we get together, uh, we'll sit down and, and one person will have about five to 10 minutes to kind of break down what's gone on in their business, where they're at, and then lay out the problem they're trying to solve. And they'll take another 30, 40 minutes from the group in terms of feedback. And they'll kind of like give feedback and you can give a little more. They'll ask you questions and they'll just kind of like help you kind of figure out that problem or think about it in a different way. And everyone goes around the table and kind of has that opportunity. And so that's, I mean, it's super powerful because a lot of times you get in your head as an entrepreneur and you think, you know, you think you, you, this is the only way to solve it or you just, you miss the bigger picture or, you know, you find yourself getting involved in something that you just really shouldn't do. If you, if you looked at it a different way, it would help. And so these masterminds are really helpful for that. In fact, I'm so, Justin, you must have a, some kind of community or mastermind for this. If you, you know, don't, it's, you absolutely I do know. It. You know, I was going to actually ask about that. It's something that's come up and I've, I have done in the past and I'm not doing right now. And so, you know, for myself, but also for listeners, what advice do you have for finding or forming that group? So, yeah. So with masterminds in particular, it's, you know, because it's um, it's tempting, especially when you get people together that don't really know each other terribly well or whatever, to be braggy or at least at least if not braggy, um, not terribly open or forthright about what's going on in their business. Because, you know, you're shy, like it's maybe things aren't going so well and you're just shy to say that or, or if it's uncomfortable. Um, and so you have to everyone in the group has to be has to commit to being extremely open about where they're at and the problems they have in their business simply good typically good to not have uh, anyone in the mastermind that you know they're directly competing for customers or you know because that could be problematic with um, opening and sharing openly and honestly um, so yeah I mean I think I think that's helpful and so that whenever we do masterminds or whenever I'm running other masterminds so one thing I say very upfront um, I've talked to people who, said, you know what, things aren't really, um, there's nothing, I have nothing really to talk about in my mastermind because things are going really well. I don't really have any problems. I'm just kind of interested in kind of talking to other people and hanging out with them. I said, well, you're not a good fit then. You're just not a good fit because if you, I mean, unless you're bringing in, you know, <laughs> crazy amounts of money um, and just sold for $100 million, like you, there's, you have problems in your business that you just do. Yep. And if you're not honest about it, um, then you're going to be problematic for the mastermind. If that makes sense. Did you did you go through an online group? I know, or like, did you? Is there any resources you recommend for for people to look like online and check out this group, or maybe pay a fee to join a group? Yeah, this is more for. I mean, it depends on the kind of the group you're looking for. I'll tell you one that I I really like. I'm a part of the Dynamite Circle, so the, with the Tropical NBA guys I mentioned before. They have a podcast, and uh, it's it's really interesting. But they they built this group of kind of expat entrepreneurs. So these are people that travel. Um, a lot are in Southeast Asia, but there's some in the U.S. as well, Europe, South America. And they, we get together every year in October. We'll get together in Bangkok. And then sometimes we'll get together like in, in uh, June in Barcelona. And we do kind of these meetups around the world. And as part of these meetups, there are talks. Um, there's a lot of networking. There's some, you know, steak dinners and beer. Um but there's a lot of masterminds too. So people will set up masterminds either through the Dynamite Circle or kind of a more informal and, and go through this. So 
you know, the masterminds that I'm a part of, um, sometimes in the DC, sometimes through this, like there's another SEO group that I'm, I work with, but you know, I mean, they're not paid masterminds. They're, you know, they're just us getting together to help each other with our businesses. Um, and I think, you know, I, we've kind of learned over time what works best and what doesn't. And so it's kind of, I'm, I'm happy to talk with you about it offline or whatever, if you think it would be helpful. But I, it, yeah, if you don't have one, like a community for that, I think there'd be a ton of value in that. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. What about, you know, this kind of leads into a, um, another question I was going to ask, which is about skill sets. And w- I'm, when I'm thinking of someone who's on active duty right now, I- I'm wondering, in your opinion, like, what skills do they need to develop between, you know, leaving the military and starting a company and any resources you'd recommend to help them um, to help them develop those skills? Yeah, so skills for running an online business. There are specific skill sets you need. And when we get you know, potential buyers that contact us and they say, look, I don't really know anything about running an online business, but can I invest in or buy one of the businesses you're selling? And in some cases, it's just no, right? And you know, there are people like, and I, I'm going to call them out now, my, my mom or my aunt, right? Who my aunt in particular was like, well, I, you know, I'm retiring. I'd love to potentially buy an online business is like, no, not today. <laughs> you got, I love you, but you've got some things you need to, to learn. Um, one of those things would be, and, and there's, there's lots of different ways you can run websites, but one of the main one and most websites are based on WordPress, yep. right? So getting some skills like knowing how to purchase domain, knowing how to tie that domain to a hosting account, knowing how to get WordPress installed, knowing how to set up a WordPress theme, uh, knowing how to add content to it and get the plugins, right? So if, if you're not um, doing content-based sites, maybe that's Shopify. So knowing, learning how to set up a Shopify site, learning how to uh, uh, source products, learning how to get samples sent over and test those samples and learning how, you know, these th- are the types of things you're going to need to know. And it depends on the type of business you're going to run. If it's e-commerce, you're probably going to be playing with Shopify. You're going to be sourcing products, um, you, you might end up at the uh, uh, Canton Fair or something like that. So if it's um, if it's Amazon Associate sites, it's setting up a WordPress site, um, learning some uh, like on-site and off-site SEO chops, um, writing content, publishing content, content that gets ranked in the search engine. So um, depending on the business model, you're going to need to learn kind of the basics. Once now, now, you can do all this like on the cheap. It doesn't cost much money at all to do most of those things. And get some chops. Once you have those skills, you have the kind of the basic skills down, or you you have a, um, a start at it. A, a lot of times, buying particularly like a smaller site or a smaller business is going to fast track that learning curve. So you've done it a bit. You're somewhat familiar with it. Buying, let's say, a fifty thousand dollar Amazon associate site is going to uh, bring the pain. <laughs> you're going to have to get up to speed really quickly to run this business or run this site. Um, and then I think once you're there, then you can start to build out a portfolio, whether that's building your own sites and selling them every 18 to you know 36 months, um, or it's buying and, and selling again 12, 24 months down the road. And there's a whole bunch of different uh, methods for this. Like I have a couple of friends, they're business partners, and they, they work out of Thailand. And they, um, every, I don't know, probably once a quarter, once every four months, they'll list a business with us and sell it for somewhere between one hundred and fifty and three hundred thousand dollars. Mm. Right? Let's say let's say a hundred to three hundred thousand um, dollars. And so they're making really good, and they, they they're creating probably five or six sites a year. A couple of them maybe fail to launch, um, but the ones that do, they end up selling it with us, and they're making really good money doing that. Just kind of like stamping out these businesses it takes about two years or so for them to mature and eventually sell on our platform. Uh, but they've been doing this for years now and have a really good process down. Other people buy from us and then 24 months, 36 months down the road, they'll make improvements to the business and turn around and sell it with us and look to reinvest the, the money into a new business that has weaknesses that they can exploit and and grow the business you know over the next couple of years. So there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. I, I love you know I love the thought that you have of accelerating someone's learning by by purchasing the business where it kind of puts your feet to the fire where you have to learn very practical things right away. How much um, how much money would someone need to do that? You had thrown out fifty thousand. I'm wondering if someone's maybe listening. Maybe they they've got a couple of years left on active duty, so they're thinking about saving money for this. So, how much money would they need? And then also, how how would they um, any advice for like 
vetting a business and being able to kick the tires and know like this is something I can handle or maybe this this stallion's a little too wild for me I need to go <laughs> go a little bit more pony size yeah so so when it comes to the size of the business this is well first let me tell you what we do and then I'll tell you what I think a buyer should look at so yeah. Um, what we do are we have minimums because if we go below these minimums, it's just too much work for us for not enough fees. So our minimum for like an AdSense or Amazon affiliate site, which are really basic and straightforward websites that earn money. Um, and when I say $10,000, that means that the Amazon or AdSense site is probably making four or 500 bucks a month. So that's kind of our minimum for Amazon and AdSense sites. So like 500 bucks a month is our minimum. And that'll sell for somewhere between... 10 and $14,000. So when it comes to like a drop shipping or e-commerce business or a service-based business, they need to be doing at least a thousand dollars a month in profit. Those would generally sell with us somewhere between 20 and let's say $30,000. Um, so those are our minimums. We do that because lower than that, and it's just not worth the fees and the hassle for our team to go through. And we, we looked at the numbers, we were, it led to about maybe like 5% of our, our uh, top line and like was like 25, 30% of our work. So we were like, that's not good, uh, good use of our time. Let's lob off the bottom. So, so those are our minimums now. And, and on top of that, I'll say, if you're going to spend less than $10,000, because you can, there, there are places like Flippa, which is like kind of the eBay for buying and selling websites but they have zero vetting process. So they don't look at the earnings, they don't look at the traffic. Anyone can list anything and sell it for anything, right? So you get a lot of kind of sites that are just set up or they're selling for like 500 bucks, but they're not earning any money. If you're gonna spend less than $10,000, you have less than $10,000 to take a stab at this, I really recommend starting from scratch instead rather than trying to buy a website or business. You may even bump that to fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. So if you don't have that much, I would suggest starting from scratch. Now there's a ton of places you can go to find out how to do that. Um, I'll just rattle off a couple. Um, this guy Spencer over at NichePursuits.com who talks about the process he uses to build businesses. He's uh, selling a business with us right now. Um, there's Tung over at CloudLiving.com. Uh, young Vietnamese dude who's just kind of like crushed it in the online space totally really well for himself But he has some stuff out there. That's interesting. If you're interested in drop shipping There's a uh, Anton at dropship lifestyle.com. He's a course on you know how to get started with building a drop shipping business So there's a bunch of people out there that can kind of show you, you know how to get started um, in terms of if you're looking to buy a business I'd say stay away from uh, the kind of more complicated businesses that um, let's say, for example, an e-commerce business uh, that's sourcing products from China that um, where the person warehouses the products themselves. Right. So it's it just like it's not it's not going through like a third party fulfillment service. It's not through Amazon. They put it in their garage and they're shipping it out. There's just a lot of there's a lot of work to those. There's a lot of things you have to do well. I mean, you have to know SEO because you've got to get your site ranked. You probably have to know paid traffic, at least Facebook or AdWords or, or some kind of paid traffic strategy. You need to know sourcing from China. You need to make sure that your shipments are good. You need to look at ensuring that shipment. You know, you need a warehouse. It's just really, it's much more complicated. So a good business for people starting off, AdSense type sites, Amazon associate type sites, FBA business model is interesting if you really want to do a physical product business. Um, in terms of like what to do, and we call it due diligence, right? It's the due diligence you're doing on a potential purchase. Um, that's really up to the buyer. I'll mention when we say vetting or when we talk about vetting, vetting is what we do as brokers. So when we're looking at a business, we don't want anyone to list anything, right? Because they could be making up the numbers. They could be making up <laughs> traffic or screenshots or whatever. So we have a team and a process for looking at their earnings, their traffic, making sure that's legitimate, checking their backlink profile, checking everything to make sure that it's real. Now, some of it is shadier than others, right? And we don't necessarily um, uh, take that out. Some of it may be a good fit for someone else and not a good fit for you. We don't know that. So anything that's like subjective like that, we kind of leave it up to the buyers to figure out. But we look for fraud. We look for unverifiable uh, earnings or unverifiable traffic, which is why we Make sure they only use like Google Analytics or Clicky because that's uh, solid third parties. So we just have a, a process that we go through and then we list the business. Now, after we do that, it's up to the buyer to do their own due diligence. And there are a lot of things that go into that. 
um, I'll tell you that you, you're kind of going to get what you pay for. So in general, if you pay a higher multiple, um, you're going to get a more solid business, a more stable business. If you're paying a lower multiple, you're going to get a less solid or stable business. doesn't mean it's bad. It may mean it has a ton of opportunity, but it could go either way. Um, and the reason for this is, you know, businesses are kind of priced on risk. So I want to, do you understand what I mean when I talk about multiple? I, I do, but I, I, I'm not sure if the average listener will. Okay, so, you know, if someone's selling their, um, let's say, Amazon, let's say an affiliate site, affiliate website, and it's making $5,000 a month in profit, maybe it's making $6,000, they have $1,000 a month worth of costs, it's making $5,000 a month in profit over the last 12 months, trailing 12 months, okay? Um, so that business is going to sell for a multiple of that profit. Right, so it's five thousand bucks a month, and they'll sell usually somewhere between twenty times and thirty-five times. So that five thousand dollar a month business could sell for anywhere from a hundred thousand dollars up to one hundred and seventy, hundred and eighty thousand dollars, or even more. Now that's a huge range, right? Like a hundred thousand dollars to one hundred and eighty. Like which, you know, <laughs> how, how, where where does it fall on that spectrum? Um, well, it's going to depend on risk. So if the business is newer, let's say that the uh, affiliate site has only been around for a year and a half. Um, it's only got it's got limited diversity in terms of the traffic it's receiving, the, the people that are that are going to the site. Uh, it's only got a few pages ranked in Google. Um, you know, it, it is. Uh, let's say it uses uh, dodgier link building techniques, um, not black hat, but let's say gray hat. Um, then that's going to sell on the lower end of the spectrum. It's have a lower multiple. If it um, has been around for four plus years, it's got really diversified traffic. It's got some paid traffic and some social in there. Um, it's got a whole bunch of pages ranked, um, and you know it's it's particularly solid business. It's going to sell on the higher end of that range. So businesses are priced based on risk generally, um, and 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 the the multiple you're going to pay reflects that. So just because you see a business selling for less or like a lower multiple, a multiple of net profit, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the one that you should buy. Um, you want to look for, you know, kind of like what meets your risk profile. This is great. Um, you know, I usually, I usually leave uh, three or four minutes for the last question just to say like, what's your final words of wisdom? Um, I know we've got about five or seven minutes. I'd love to give you a little bit more time just because like, um, I feel like there's so much that you can share with, with listeners that would help them. And I've, I've asked the questions I thought would be helpful, but I'm just curious, you know, you, you are on active duty. Like what, what else would you want someone listening who's maybe in the military right now or recently transitioned? What other advice do you have? What resources, anything else you'd want? them to know yeah so you know when i was in the navy I, like the life i have right now in terms of like being able to travel and, and do what i want we run a team of people that do similarly we have an apprentice program where we actually every three to six months we hire apprentices bring them out to southeast asia have them work with us for a few months and then have them on the team so we're building kind of this company that that we love i mean we love our lifestyle we love what we're building we love what we're doing and I never thought that was really possible, I think, when I got out of the Navy. I didn't even know that was possible. So, you know, I, I kind of help those that are ambassadors for spreading the word. And I know that one of your recommended books is like The 4-Hour Workweek. That was helpful for me, and it was really helpful for other people that are, that are kind of in, on this path, this expat entrepreneur path where they travel and work and meet up with friends around the world, and they're you know, um, globe trotting, but not because they're trust fund kids, but because they're able to build an online bu uh, business that makes them money, you know, whether they're working their eight or nine hour shift or not. I mean, you can go days and not do any work and then you buckle down and do like a 14 hour day. And that's kind of our life out here. Um, so I guess just saying that this lifestyle is really possible. And I live with and I'm friends with a bunch of people that are doing it is amazing. And, and, you know, uh, some of the resources I shared on this podcast, uh, we talk about that quite a bit on our podcast, Empire of Lovers podcast. We talk about it um, as well, definitely in the earlier episodes. Um, so I just I wanted to let people know that that's possible, especially, you know, veterans that have lived overseas and kind of had a taste of like, I want that. Like, that's exciting to me. It's fun. And it's just something I want a, a part of my life. I just want them to know that it's real, like that's doable.
That's great. I mean, and I'll I'll put in the show notes, I'll put links to cloudliving.com, Dropship Lifestyle, Justin's podcast, all, all of these resources. But um, I just really appreciate, you know, I appreciate the advice that you're giving people, but I also think that you're just an incredible example of, you know, you're building the company you want, you're building the lifestyle you want, you're, you're making these things happen. And I think it's just great for, um, especially for those who are still on active duty, it's, you know, the two things I just want to point out is like, Justin is proof that you can create whatever life you're thinking of, you can create that. But the, the flip side that you know, I think comes through in Justin's story, he might not have overtly put it, is he's done a lot of work to get there. And he's, he has been seizing this opportunity. He has been working hard. So I I always like to point that out of like this, this life he's describing, anyone listening, if this is appealing to you, that is attainable. And just don't underestimate the work it will take to make that happen. It's not going to be like anyone's going to hand this to you. You're going to be learning these skills. You're going to be finding these mastermind groups. You need to make that happen. And it's definitely within your reach. Yeah, that's right. You know, so there's the, the 10,000 hours rule to really become an expert at something, right? And uh, you know, another way to think about it is anyone that's kind of like on an entrepreneurial path, it seems to be about three years. There's something about like that three year mark you hit where things, especially if you're doing the same thing and you're kind of like hammering it out and you're gonna go, it's a lot of work during that point and there's gonna be low points, but the low points get less low over time and it seems like, not always the case, but around the three year mark, um, people tend to kind of like break out and kind of hit their stride. And so, yeah, there's it's a slog and you know, to be honest with you, Justin, I look back to those kind of scarier earlier times in our business fondly. And, you know, but I do, I guess I do this with the Navy too, right? There were times where I hated the unreps or whatever. <laughs> I just really hated it. I look back at it now, though, and I, I was just talking with someone the other night at like a dinner party telling him about my time in the Navy and you were so fascinated. And it reminded me, you know, I'm looking back at it way better than I felt at the time. Mm-hmm. Right? At the time, I was like, oh, I hate this. But now I'm like, Oh, listen to this cool stuff we did. And I, I think I probably talk about our starting our business the same way. I'm like, oh, listen to this. Cra- like, it was so scary. We did this, and you know, we all. I had worried I was gonna have to leave the Philippines and go tuck my tail between my legs and go get a job in the U.S. And it was frightening. But now I look back, I'm like, oh yeah, those are the fun times. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, for listeners, I'll have all sorts of stuff in the show notes. You can find Justin at uh, empireflippers.com. Also, check out his podcast. They've got over 169 episodes. That's at empireflippers.com slash podcasts. Uh, You can find that on iTunes as well. Uh, Justin, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks, Justin. Appreciate it. Surface, surface, surface. Well, that's all for today. Uh, I hope you check out empireflippers.com. I hope you check out the show notes at beyondtheuniform.io. A couple few things before you take off. One, if you haven't already, please leave a positive review on iTunes. It helps us get the word out about the show. Two, if you haven't signed up for our newsletter yet, please do. Beyondtheuniform.io, starting to do a lot more with our newsletter. Would love to keep you in the loop on that. And third, if you know of those who would benefit from Beyond the Uniform, please spread the word. Would love to get this in front of more veterans. Thanks, and see you next week.